much about yuppies these days, Taplines listener. That doesn't mean they didn't have a moment. They most certainly did. The term, a neologism born from the acronym that stood for either young urban professional or young upwardly mobile professional, depending on who you ask, came into vogue in the mid-80s to describe the droves of college-educated baby boomers that entered metropolitan workforces with hotshot salaries, slick style, and a taste for flashing cash. So-called yuppie scum were hugely polarizing for obvious reasons, and we're going to talk about all that, which means we're going to talk about Heineken, too. Joining Tap Lines today is Philip Van Munching, the author of Beer Blast, the inside story of the brewing industry's bizarre battles for your money. The book, which is great, by the way, I highly suggest you go pick it up, was published in 1997 after the cultural rise and fall of yuppies had pretty much played out. But as a third-generation employee at Heineken's third-party American importer, Van Munching & Company, its author lived and worked through the era in which the green-bottled Dutch beer became synonymous with sophistication, style, and class. In the collective imagination of the 80s hard-charging strivers, making it was everything. And when you got there, you ordered a Heineken. In part one of this Tap Lines 2 parter, Philip takes us back to his beginnings at the family firm, where he cut his teeth in the trade before going to work on marketing the Heineken brand to a mostly adoring public. He had a fine line to walk, playing up the mystique of the pricey European import that his father and grandfather had painstakingly built up in the United States for decades without cheapening the brand by leaning too heavily into the yuppiedom's conspicuous consumption for a quick cash grab. And all the while, the Dutch macro brewer is growing more interested in bringing its U.S. operations back in-house, Corona was on the rise from Mexico, and this thing called microbrew was starting to gain some momentum. As you can tell, there's a lot going on in this story, so we better get into it. It's Philip Van Munching, it's America's top European import of the 80s, it's the yuppification of Heineken, and it's all right here right now on Von Pairs Tablines. Philip Van Munching, welcome to Taplines on the Von Pair Podcast Network. We're so glad to have you here. Dave, thanks so much. Thrilled to be here. Phil, where you, Philip, where are you joining us from? Uh, Darien, Connecticut. And I understand that you've you've had a, a bad spell lately, but you're bravely soldiering on through uh, to join us today on the show. Uh, so I was just at the germiest place on earth, better known as Disney World. <laughs> and as I've told a million people, I've been to countless rock concerts in the last couple of years and packed in with people screaming lyrics out. Two days in the Magic Kingdom, and I am sick as a dog. <laughs> oh, no. Well, we're very sorry to hear it. You sound no great. Worries. And uh, I know our listeners appreciate you uh, you stepping up to the plate because we got a big story to tell, Philip. We've, we've got, um, you know, a major piece of American beer industry history uh, to unpack today. And it's not just beer industry history. In, in your case, uh, you're, you're here on Tap Lines today because it is – also family history for, for you as, as part of the Van Munching family. We were, we were speaking just before we, uh, we pressed record that um, listeners of a certain age, of which we have many, we of course here at Tap Lines welcome listeners of all ages, uh, tell your friends, tell your grandparents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, listeners of a certain age may recognize that surname that I just uh, pronounced. Philip, where would, they, where would they recognize that from if they, uh, if they were closely listening to the radio many years ago? They didn't even have to be closely listening after about <laughs> 10 billion radio ads by law that had to be tagged. Imported by Van Munching and Company, New York, New York. Ooh, still got the dulcet tones, Philip, yeah. even though <laughs> even through the sickness, you sound great. <laughs> there uh, you go. So Van Munching and Company, many of our younger listeners, on the other hand, aren't familiar with that at all. They're like, hang on a second. I thought this was an episode about Heineken. I know Heineken. I've never heard of Van Munching and Company. Uh, what's the relationship there? So cast your mind back to 1933, as most of us can. <laughs> My grandfather is the um, bar manager on the Holland America line, on the Staten Dam. And he meets a couple of guys from the Heineken Brewery. Prohibition is about to end. It's been voted down. It's not officially over yet. And they decide they're going to take a crack at the U.S. market. And my grandfather, king of bluster, says, I, I can do this. And he talks them into sending him as their representative to the United States with 50 cases of beer, which he peddles a six pack at a time in New Jersey and in Manhattan. And that's the beginning of Van Munching and Company. 
Wow. So for 1933, he secures himself. What is that? I mean, I suppose that becomes the importer license. I don't know. Was, was, did Eventually, it even exist? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he, did it, he did it with an existing wholesaler. Um, okay. God knows who that was. Yeah, and yeah. There's, there isn't a test at the end of this podcast. So uh, <laughs> he set up with them and he was their representative. And eventually he was able to move to the Miami market as well. And I believe like Philadelphia and a few others. And became a company unto himself as their sole importer. And then he sold to distributors rather than working directly with them, you know, with rather than having the beer shipped to them as the point of contact, it was basically all shipped centrally and then sent out to distributorships. So what many people, you know, who are not students of the beer industry like you are and uh, listeners know because they've gotten to this point in the episode that you were the author of Beer Blast, which is a book about your experience uh, working at the Van Munching, uh, Van Munching and Company and importing Heineken and marketing Heineken. Um, many, I think, listeners may have never sort of sussed out the nuance there, but there was a long period of Heineken's history as a brand where it was not itself uh, operating in the way it is now in, in the United States. Well, it was just tiny in terms of volume. Um, as That's I said, we thing. sort of started building... <laughs> Uh, on the East Coast somewhat, and then a little thing called World War II broke out, mm. and no more beer from Holland. And we were actually able to ship Heineken through a brewery in Java until the Japanese got in, and then there was no more Heineken in the U.S. for a while. So my grandfather took a job, basically helped out the Dutch government, <laughs> not in exile, but you know from the United States. Yeah, yeah. And when the war ended, all these GIs came back with a taste for European beer. And so shipments started up right away, and then it started spreading across the country. But it really didn't achieve any major volume until the 70s, 80s. Yeah, and that is the period that we're here to discuss, really, in the 80s in particular, because you covered it in the book Beer Blast, and, and I had been schooled, as I was saying before we began recording. My father was in the beer industry for some time, um, you know, during that period and immediately after, where there was a... Uh, a um, just sort of an enormous groundswell for people who were looking for, um, you know, conspicuous consumption opportunities, right? They wanted to demonstrate their standing. They wanted to demonstrate their taste level. And we'll, we'll talk about that period and what it did for Heineken and what Heineken did for it um, in just a moment. But you've scrolled our tap lines time machine back to 1933. Let's let's scroll it forward to uh, to where you come into the picture at Van Munching and Company. Uh, that would be 1963 when I just got stuck in a crib listening to this guy talk beer 24 hours a day. <laughs> now, um, I came in. I joke about this all the time, but it is true. I sat across the breakfast table and learned the beer business. Yeah. Just by osmosis. Cool. And it was fascinating. And I'll, I'll, I'll spoil the plot of this whole thing right away. I don't like beer. I have never <laughs> been a beer drinker. Don't have a taste I for think, it. I think that's like the greatest way to be in this. Uh, when I was working on the book, I realized I didn't have any horse in this race. I yeah. wasn't going to be snobby about anybody else's beer because I'm happy with a ice cold Budweiser. So yeah, yeah. I grew up sort of understanding the marketing end of it because I didn't really care about the alcohol beverage end mm -hmm. of it. Um, and I went off to journalism school. And at the end, I realized very quickly I did not want to be a reporter. And graduation was weeks away <laughs> when my father said, you know, we're thinking about doing our PR in-house. Any interest in uh, joining? I'm like, let me think about Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> Uh, so I joined as director of corporate communications. When is that? Uh, in fact, do you remember fact, the year? Uh, that would be 85, 85. And I don't think I even had a title that grand at that point. It was, you know, boss's son, peon. <laughs> right, right, uh, in the, and, right in the press releases. Yeah. And to my father's great credit, for the first six months, I was out on the road. Anybody who came into the company in any kind of a higher position, as it were, who was not a salesman or wasn't working, you know, um, in traffic or accounting, whatever, went out and learned the trade. Mm. So I went on sales calls for six months all over this area, basically, and learned how to pack out stores and get rid of uh, old product and schmooze people and all of that. And it was really, it was quite an education. So by the time I finally landed in the office, 
I wasn't some kid who came from Pepsi Cola the week before and sure. was probably going to sell tampons six months from now, <laughs> Right. which, you know, I encounter not to jump ahead, but I encountered later on when Heineken took over. Right. Pe- people come into your industry and tell you how to do it right off the bat. And it sure. just made me nuts. And I understood why my father ran the company the way he did. No one tells anyone how to do journalism because no one really wants to deal with journalism anymore. Everyone's done with journalism. No one. <laughs> so, so you avoided one uh, uh, pitfall, which is you didn't become a reporter, which congratulations, that's probably the right decision given the state of the industry. <laughs> but the other is that no one really bothers you as a reporter because it's your job to bother everybody else. <laughs> which, which was my shortcoming. I have nothing but respect for my classmates who are major journalists. Yeah. Um, and, and I won't embarrass them by naming them all, but I, I've got some people who are doing some pretty big jobs, but I was not great at bothering people. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're not here to bother you today, Philip. We're here to, to rehash some old and I think mostly fun history, although maybe there's some, some painful memories in there, uh, uh, but hopefully time has healed those wounds. Um, so you join Van Munching and Company in 1985. You hit the road. Uh, you're out in the trade, you're, you're working Heineken. Tell us a little bit about your perception. I mean, you just come out of college. You, you know what young people are drinking like, because you're a young person at this time. You're, you know, you're out also as a consumer, uh, uh, you know, ordering, ordering beer. Where was Heineken in terms of its brand, uh, uh, at that time? Like, was it, had it yet sort of bubbled towards the Vanguard or was it still, Kind of that that um, you know that that lower volume brand that your grandfather and then your father had kind of come up with. Understanding that it never became a major volume brand because mm. if you think of the import segment, you know a couple of percent of the U.S. beer market tops. Sure. Um, it was. <laughs> here's my shortcoming as a, as the son of a beer importer. I didn't understand when I got out of college that chasing after what the kids wanted was a terrible idea. Mm. The reason Heineken did as well as it did, and it, it was it was already on top of the import segment. That didn't mean much because it was a very small segment, but it was on top by a lot. And the reason it was, was because we did boring, aspirational advertising. Mm. This is the beer your boss drinks. When you make it, you drink this beer. And, right. and I know you and I are going to talk a bit about badges, so let me, let me start there. Yeah, go jump right ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know about you. I can't walk into the Ferrari dealership and say, I'll take two in red, please. <laughs> right. But for an extra buck, I can sit at any bar and have a green bottle in front of me and have everybody know I paid more for my beer. Mm. And that's what I learned over the first six months of working for the company, that it was not about what we saw in Bud ads and Coors ads or whatever. It was about making sure that the image of the brand was this is the best. We don't need this other nonsense. We are, you know, we're the best you can do. Now, yeah. the reality of that in terms of beer brands is kind of a joke. Americans don't really like heavy beer. Heineken was probably the outer edge of the American taste bud. Mm-hmm. Perfectly acceptable lager, but, you know. Um, but our imagery was such that because it had a little bit of a heavier taste, and because it was a little more expensive, people thought, I'm signaling everybody, I've made it. Yeah. Here's my badge. Yeah. What's going on in the culture, at the broader culture, not in terms of the beer industry at this time, but we're in the middle of, I think, what, 85 would have been, Reagan gets in, yeah. uh, elected in 80, um, and then he, you know, he's obviously- Reagan's been reelected. Yeah, he's got second he's term. He's lost his colon and some of his memory at this point. <laughs> Uh, no one knows more of which. Yeah, <laughs> that's sorry. A, that's the old a joke about the the Reagan typewriter, the the, the <laughs> no. old fashioned kind. No, no colon and no memory. <clears throat> <laughs> sorry, but um, uh, <laughs> Back to the Future is the big thing at the box office. Yes. What else is going on in eighty five? Um, we are we are entering the yuppie era. That's what I'm getting at. So yeah. the other thing, the other cultural touchstone that I was going to point to is uh, Macintosh. Uh, Apple, you know, is is starting to promote not just the concept of the personal computer, um, which has already been around, of course. Um, right. You know, IBM is a giant at this point, and Compaq and and all of the others. Um, Hewlett Packard coming out of Stanford and whatnot. Um, they had a long history at that point, but Apple is promoting the 
personal computer as a lifestyle item, as a signifier, right? There's a, right. there's brand recognition around this thing that really had been treated as a commodity unto that point, right? It's this tech geeky thing. You can piece it together from whatever parts you get at the computer store, blah, blah, blah. No, Apple comes along and says, well, we have, we sell Macintosh computers. You want this thing. You got, it's got the nice, you know, the, the logo on it. That's now of course, like quite iconic. And that I, I wanted to bring that up. They do the 1984 ad, which of course has gone down in in uh, um, you know advertising lore as uh, one of the canon um, um, you know spots of all time in the American ad business. Um, but I think like I thought that would be maybe a useful frame of reference to kind of understand like commercially sort of where things are headed in the consumer goods space. Does that resonate? Do you, first of all, you lived through it. Like, do you yeah. remember that being, you know, sort of like in the air or in the ether at that time? No, no question. I had a PC junior in college mm. and I had to figure that out. <laughs> and all of a sudden here comes Mac and there's no figuring anything out. It's pictures on your screen yep. and you just click on them and stuff opens and you yep. don't have to know names of things. And, um, and much more to the point, more people had them. Very few people had PC juniors or personal computers of any kind before the Mac came along as kind of the, the thing that was in your kitchen or in your house that everybody right. could use. Right. Um, and, and there, there's a, <laughs> It's a little bit of consumerism in that because suddenly we were paying more for things. Oh, they were they were fantastically yeah. even, more expensive even back then. I mean, now we kind of all I think understand the premium that Apple has earned in the marketplace, and you can go back and forth with people on whether or not it's quote unquote worth it. But it's undoubtedly something they're able to command and defend in the market. But back then they were still way more expensive yes. than than PCs. Yeah. Yeah, they were way more expensive. It's funny. I was talking to one of my kids about this. Your computer cost a hell of a lot more than your television back then. Mm. And your television was expensive. Yeah. <laughs> and now you can have a computer for about the cost of a television back then. Yeah. And, and it, the can, television it can be in your pocket, too, if you want. Television is <laughs> free, basically. You go to Best Buy, they load it in your car for you now. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no, the packaging is, is you know, well, I mean, and there's a corollary with the beer industry, of course. Not not much uh, parallel with the beer industry, but the old joke, especially at the value end of the spectrum, is that the liquid is basically free. It's the aluminum yeah. and the excise tax that you're paying for right. Right. <laughs> when you go out and buy a six-pack, and maybe some cardboard, too, given the price of cardboard these days. Okay, so... Uh, you're, you're coming out of journalism school in the eighties. Your father gives you the call. You arrive at Van Munching and company. Um, what, what did the business look like at that point? Not so much from a volume of beer perspective, more, uh, what's the operation look like? You're importing all of Heineken for the entire United States. Uh, uh, are we talking about a major operation here? Are we talking about a skyscraper? What's this thing look like? No, no. It, it's uh, a floor and an extra office in Midtown Manhattan. In fact, we were in the building that Radio City Music Hall is in. Yeah, no kidding. Which made Christmas just brutal on us because you couldn't <laughs> leave the building without running into wall truckloads people, of yeah. either very old people or very young people. <laughs> and neither of them can find their bus, you know? <laughs> right. Um, I, I, my best friend uh, was our media director and he would walk around outside with his hands like he had a, a megaphone saying, it's only a tree. Please look at it and go home. <laughs> That's a rite uh, of passage, I think, for generations of my brother yeah. works in that area in Manhattan, and I've I've had that same experience going up to visit his office. New York may change in millions of different ways, but I don't think that will ever change because no, it was the Rockefeller the exact Center thing. tree is still a pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah, no exactly. What. No, we were uh, we were pretty streamlined. We had about uh, 50, 60 people in the New York office, uh, traffic, accounting. Um, and traffic was basically shipping. It mm -hmm. was bringing the beer from Holland to America because the way we ran basically is we bought beer from Heineken. They brought it to the dock in Amsterdam that's, or Rotterdam. That's it. We picked it up. We shipped it here. We distributed it across the country. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it's far more complicated because we shipped to many different places. But we were responsible for everything to do with the beer once we picked it up from them. Where was the uh, beer coming into, Philip? Newark? Uh, yeah. Port yeah. For Elizabeth the most part. Yeah. And God knows where else. Cause that's a long time ago. Yeah. Now. Bayonne but, but, maybe. Yeah. 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 
Gotcha. Um, so we'd come in and, and then you guys... We and then being railroaded across the country or mm-hmm. wherever. And, mm-hmm. and it was shipped to some ports in the West Coast too, but it stuck a gun to my head, I couldn't tell you. Yeah, yeah. But we essentially um, had a, a pretty streamlined operation where we were different from other importers is that we had our own sales force. Most importers would uh, sell to distributorships and the distributor sales force were the people that were out in the trade. They were going to the bars, going to the supermarkets, taking orders, filling orders. My father maintained 100 or so salesmen around the country. Whoa. Who had, um, they each had their own area they were handling. And we had district managers and they, you know, for some distributors, I think at first it was like, why are you looking over our shoulders? And then they realized very quickly, thank you for bringing an order pad and helping us yeah. here. <laughs> because they're still getting the sales. Yeah, yeah. We're just making sure that the product is being treated correctly in the accounts. We're making sure um, they have whatever they need for whatever um, beer nights, whatever that they're doing. Sure. So that doesn't um, slip through the cracks at, you know, the uh, Southern Illinois distribution point for Heineken. It's like, well, if there's inbound from someone in Chicago, it's a good yeah. account. Let's make sure we get this done. There's another no, set of hands there. No question. And yeah. there was another uh, major benefit <laughs> in that we were looking over their shoulders from this standpoint. When you have, let's say you have 100 distributors around the country. There are 100 different ideas of how your stuff should be handled. Mm. And every once in a while... One of our salesmen would say, you know, our distributor in Des Moines wants to do a grab a Heine t-shirt night. And my father would say, I will fire your ass in three <laughs> seconds if that happens. He would say it much more nicely, but that was the message. Yeah. He would always say, my friend, my friend, if that happens. Um, <laughs> we we very jealously guarded the image of the brand. Let's talk a little bit more about this idea, this idea that Heineken is you know, um, ambitious, it is aspirational. Um, and I think like to some people, especially from the contemporary perspective where we conflate, I think ambition with hard charging sort of startup y fake it till you make it type of, you know, uh, rise and grind behavior is the, is the common parlance these days. Um, those maybe seem contradictory, right? Like being conservative, but also being, um, um, aspirational, ambitious, but with Heineken, well, I'm sorry, were you talking about Vivek Ramaswamy or something else? <laughs> close personal friend. Oh, sorry. Of, yeah. Close personal friend no. of the show. <laughs> no, no, I, I kid, I kid. No, but thank you. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, you know, I think like there, uh, and, and I think this is why I wanted to get into this and why we had you on partly today to discuss is that there's this vision of what success looks like and what aspiration, you know, people are, what people are aspiring to, American drinkers are aspiring to at that time. Right. Tell me how, in your view, because you shaped it when you were there and your father did when he was, when he was on, hands on there as well and all the workers did as well. Um, what about this brand gave it permission to be that aspiration? I mean, obviously you had success with it once you started doing it, but how did it occur to you that this conservatively managed brand, and I mean, not politically conservative, I mean, socially yeah. conservative brand, uh, uh, had entree to be an ambitious stretch reach brand beer for uh for an entire generation of americans what were the signals at that time uh right off the bat pricing yeah you, you've, you've got a, a brand coming from europe it's acknowledged that europe is the leader in in beer production right mm. everybody goes for european beers or, or the thought is this is where beer was born yes we were dutch so we were next door to germany but uh european beer was a big thing sure uh it costs more to buy it uh and and aspiration partially comes from protecting your pricing. Um, I can't remember what the the booze brand was that when they jacked up their prices, they went way up in volume. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's and, like and the, it's, v, uh, the, I think the economic uh, theory here is the Veblen effect um, named after the guy who coined it, but it's basically what you're describing. The more expensive something gets at some point there's an inflection point and then people are like well it must be it's expensive because it must be better that's more luxury i want it yeah. right so so tie that in with the the conservative advertising uh and an absolute 
push to make sure that we were in the finest restaurants mm. and bars mm. and every other bar too. But we made damn sure that we were really servicing those accounts that were higher end because that's where taste is made in, in, in the beer biz. And the other thing, the, my, my father's great secret was he knew what his lane was and he stayed in it and he stayed all over it. Mm. So many people come in and we're going to be this to this consumer and we're going to be that to that consumer. We're going to be everything to everybody and pretty soon you're nothing to nobody. <laughs> Um, and you know, I would argue, and again, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, Please but do. the fate of Heineken after my father left was very much, these guys looked at the U S beer market and said, look how big it is. We should have a much bigger share and stopped being the number one selling imported beer within two years of his leaving. Wow. Like really quickly because they didn't hang on to the imagery. They, oh, it's boring. <laughs> boring sells, dudes. Yeah, yeah. In this case, yeah, sir, sure, certainly. Who who takes over from from when Heineken gives up the number one spot? Corona? Yes. Yeah, so clear bottle yeah. versus- You said there would be painful parts of this interview. I, if there's the, anything the on word. this end, it's yeah. the COVID. It's not me crying. <laughs> yeah, not the coronavirus, just corona generally. <laughs> oh, no, and uh, again- I, I have great respect for Corona and I really respect their advertising. Mm. I think these guys are brilliant because it's like Coors Light. I mean, it is super refreshing and not particularly challenging. Yep. You know, there's not it's an much unremarkable flavor. liquid. Yeah, no, I agree. The, yeah. um, the, there's a really dirty joke in my book that I could also tell about Corona, but I won't because I have some class. But it's it's really watery and Therefore, it's really well tolerated by a lot of people. But for that to be the number one selling imported beer just kills me. A twist of the knife. Yeah. 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 If it were going to fall off its top spot, at least you'd like to see it go to uh, <laughs> a beer that had you know, maybe a little bit more nuance in it. Yeah. And it gained on us in the 80s. Sure. A lot. And one of the reasons, the big reason it gained on us in the 80s is because we bought our beer in Gilders. We had to buy the Dutch Gilder in order to buy beer. Interesting. So when... All of the sudden, the exchange rate went to, uh, forgive the technical language, complete and utter shit. <laughs> and we had to pay, I believe the spread at one point, it was 28 cents for a gilder, became 56 cents for a gilder. Holy twice as much. Smokes. And we could not do extra advertising. And we had to be a little careful about how we spent money. And Corona had the opposite problem. Or not problem. Corona had the, yeah. the benefit. They were on the that, uh, the good end of the double edged sword. Yeah. <laughs> exactly right. Um, and Corona started coming up, and we saw it. And we, uh, I was just talking to my wife about this. We did an ad campaign that I was super proud of. The tagline was, "When you're done kidding around, Heineken." And essentially, in each of the ads, there was, to your point about yuppies, there's a very stereotypical person of of the late 80s, mm. uh, the guy in the tracksuit, the guy who looks like he's on safari because he's just shopped at Banana Republic. And, it, you know, and they're all talking to the camera about what makes their beer so special. And the guy when the Banana Republic holds up a giant oil can. We don't say that it's Foster's, but you know damn well it's yeah, Foster's. Yeah, I was going to say and Foster's says, was the other year, right? Yeah. And he says, my beer, the bigger the better, mate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and we had the guy in the tracksuit, my beer with an obvious Corona, so hip yep. with a twist. Yep. And he's got the twist of lemon or lime in it. <laughs> and, you know, we sort of had fun with the fact that if your beer needs any of this gimmickry, it's probably not worth being your beer. And all of a sudden, Corona went back down and we continued our rise and things went well. Because, again, it's not the most exciting advertising on earth, but we played to our strength. Yeah. There's a reason we're number one. Tell me a little bit more about the uh, the aesthetic of the yuppie. I mean, you kind of flicked to some of the hallmarks, but I think for some of, again, for some of our younger listeners, this is a somewhat unfamiliar term. Uh, they heard me talk about it earlier in the intro, a young unmarried professional. Uh, sometimes young urban professional. I was going to say urban professional. People yeah. say urban, uh, or excuse me, it's urban, and then sometimes people say unmarried, but that I think came along later because people now refer to like dual income, no kids as like dink. Um, I think, <laughs> I think that's what it's called. It's I a, forgot that. Yeah, yeah. It's like a sort of an, an anachronistic, but nevertheless a, a phrase. Anyway, young urban professional, um, uh, what what are the signifiers that you remember from that time or that you wrote into those ads, the when you're done kidding around ads? Okay, so for your younger listeners, 
This is really simple. Yuppies were the influencers of the 80s and 90s, mm. right? Now we call them influencers. Now they all have Instagram accounts with 5 million followers, whatever. Right. It's the same idea. These were the guys who were going out and showing off what they had, what they could spend, what they did for a living. Um, and they had a taste for great stuff, so they worked really well for us. But, you know, they didn't exist in the numbers to really give anybody a boost. Mm -mm. They just existed in the numbers to set an example for people. And, you know, yuppiedom was pretty silly and certainly very selfish, but a lot of them had pretty good taste. Yeah. And they also, you had this great line in your book that I, I mentioned to you when I had first reached out uh, to do the show that I think really sums it up, which is like people want their stinking badges. And yeah. whether or not, I mean, Heineken obviously has this long history, even in, in the United States at this point in the 80s, has this long history as a, you know, a, a quality brand that people view as, you know, sort of a, a quality import, but it's not making big moves. But it became a hallmark of uh, a badge of a certain type of consumer. My question, Philip, is, or one of them is, how big of a deal was the bottle? And maybe this will be a good way to get into talking about the brown bottled beer uh, that was yeah. it was also in the mix. But uh, how big of a deal was the green bottle? Like, what, we I just asked you about the characteristics of yuppies themselves. Well. What were the characteristics of the Heineken bottle at that time? Well, A, it set us apart because it was green. Yep. It's dark green glass. Just not many of uh, those. But, yeah. but B, it was, between the glass and the label, it was easily identifiable. And and again, I would, uh, you know, especially then you go into a bar and if you said, uh, I'll have a Heineken, and if they went to pour it in the glass and take the bottle, no, no, leave the bottle. Mm. Because I want everybody sitting around to know that I just blew more money than I needed to for my beer. Yeah, yeah. You know, what's the point of having the um, status symbol unless everybody can see it? Sure, <laughs> sure. Don't park my Porsche down in the garage. Please put it <laughs> in the driveway. You know, it's, I was just talking to somebody about that. I, I went to school in the Midwest and uh, somebody said, well, what, what was that like? Like Lake Forest was... was um, notorious at that point because of the John Hughes movies sure. and Risky Ferris Business Bueller's and all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. right. And I said, uh, I finally understood the old, old money versus new money thing mm. because I grew up in Fairfield County, Connecticut, where the richest guys would wear their sweatshirts on Saturday afternoon and shop at the local whatever. Yeah. And they had more money than God. And I go to the Midwest where in places like Lake Forest, they had a Porsche parked out in the driveway. They had a perfectly good garage, but how could everybody <laughs> know what they had unless they put it out front yeah. and that was new money? Yeah. Um, and, you know, they're, they're all, we're all terrible, but, um, <laughs> but I, I understood badges, you know, I got it. And, and back then a Lacoste shirt, you had a little alligator sure. on your shirt. Sure. You had your Puma sneakers with the whatever, eventually Nike with the swoosh. Badges are badges. That gets at another question that I wanted to ask, which is when you at the time were considering I'm not sure if you ever explicitly considered it, but like, what was like the, you know, people call it now like a brand set. Like what were the, what were the peer brands that you looked to or that you would expect to turn up if people are drinking Heineken, what other, what other badges would you expect to turn up maybe? Uh, in, in my era, Beck's essentially. Mm. Moosehead to some extent, remember there were different tiers to imports. There were the European imports, Heineken and Beck's, essentially. Uh, the Mexican and uh, Canadian imports were a slightly different price category. They were in between American premium beers and imported European beers, basically because they just had to rail it across the country as sure. opposed to stick it on ships. Yep. Um, so it fosters to a small extent, although, I, as I love to point out to people, fosters screwed around so much that their volume was so low, they decided the way to deal with things was to stop making it in Australia. And essentially it became Canadian for beer hosers, you know? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> the Fosters, which still tried to make people believe it was coming from Australia, was brewed in Canada. Yep, yep. And there were some of those types of 
uh, you could call them, I guess, charitably, you know, hijinks. I think like it, yeah. more, more uh, critically, you'd call it, you know, a sleight of hand or chicanery on behalf of the brand. Lowenbrow, I'm thinking specifically about uh, Miller when it when it acquired Lowenbrow and started brewing it here. Um, and Anna, Without really telling anybody. Exactly, and yeah. Anheuser-Busch wound up suing them as, yeah, as yeah. people may or may not remember. And there was a whole thing. And then I think that also presaged a lot of the or some of the anxiety we had some echoes of that in you know 10 years later 15 years later when uh anheuser Bush sues boston beer company over where jim cook is brewing sam adams yeah. uh and because it was famously infamously to some people was a contract brewer um which pittsburgh w- pennsylvania the yeah. <laughs> that's, brewing right. Company. that's right and I think I don't had, remember what I had for lunch today, but I remember that because he was the biggest thorn in my side. Is that right? Oh, Jim Cook. Yeah. And I love the guy, yeah. actually. And we became friendly after. But uh, he built his brands by knocking our brand, sure. specifically our sure. brand. Don't forget, listener, that was part one of our two part episode about Heineken with Philip Van Munching. There's plenty more to this story, so remember to join us next week for part two which will appear directly following this one in your feed. Taplines is recorded in Richmond, Virginia, and produced by yours truly in Darby Seaside, who, along with the talented Shane Farrick, composed our delightful soundtrack. Just listen to it. I also want to give a quick shout-out to the entire Vine Pair team, and especially co-founders Adam Teeter and Josh Mallon, editor-in-chief Joanna Chirino, managing editor Tim McCurdy, and art director Danielle Grinberg, who designed our lovely Taplines logo. And of course, a big thank you to you, yes you listener, for spending time with us week in and week out. We literally couldn't do this without you. I'm Dave Infante, and I'll catch you next time.